11, verses 20 through 25. Mark 11, 20. Now in the morning, as they passed by and saw the fig tree dried up from the roots, and Peter remembering said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered away. So Jesus answered and said to them, Have faith in God, for surely as I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask, and when you pray, believe that you will receive them, and you will have them. And whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him, that your Father in heaven may also give, forgive your trespasses. Thank you, Daniel. What a great day today. It's so nice to be here, and it's so nice to be in Arizona. It's nice to have weather a little bit warmer and just all kinds of good things. We've got a mission team that's come back from El Salvador, and it's good to have them back. Uh, it looks like most of them are alive, so uh, that's a good thing. We've got kids in California now at a Bible Bowl, and so... I don't think we're ever here all at the same time. It seems like we're always being scattered in different places. Uh, one of the things I want you aware of is we're going to try and rush a little bit this morning so that the elders can pray at the end of the service. And that's one of the things that they like to do. I know it's one of the things that you like to do. I think it's one of the things that's really, really important is to be able to ask God for things that he wants to be done here. And so we're going to try to make time for that at the end of our service. But I want you to think about fig trees and about mountains and about uh, what Jesus talks about in this passage in Mark chapter 11. So I put the illustration up here already. That's what it would look like. That's what you were thinking too, right? If, if you saw mountains moving, now there would be no green grass in Arizona but it would just be a whole lot of, I think that maybe that's the haboob that comes through and the mountain just turned over uh, or something like that, but that's what causes those things. I think it's important for us to understand what faith is all about. We've been trying to do our theme, Believe, this year, and this is another very critical lesson in this whole process. This is something that makes all the difference. We talked about you need to believe in order to be pleasing to God. We talked about being able to call things into being as Abraham did. It, it was impossible for him to have a child. And yet, because of God, he's able to say, okay, I'll build the crib now. And it's a little while before the sun comes, but he believes even things that are impossible so that those things do occur. Those things happen. And that's the great blessing of being a Christian is things that are impossible are able to happen. And that's just one of those incredible things, and so we're going to look at this a little bit. I want to back up with you, however, this time, and, and kind of get this whole context together, because I think that's important. If you back up to Mark 11 and verse 11, it says, As he entered Jerusalem, he went into the temple, and when he had looked around at everything, he was... As it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. And on the following day, when he came to Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And he said to it, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. That seems like a strange thing to be able to put in just as a matter of record in the gospel. Uh, you know, that just seems very weird. But you have to understand where all this fits. You see, as he's saying this, he went into Jerusalem, looked around, but this is right after the triumphal entry. This is the end of the parade. He has gotten a colt. They've been riding into town. It's the hero's welcome. If you were the conquering hero and you had captured another country and were bringing people in, you had a parade coming into town. And, and so that's what Jesus has. And he's coming into town as if he's the conquering hero already. 
And, and so the passage in the first part of Mark is people are laying their coats on the ground. There's palm branches. They're, they're praising God, Hosanna to God in the highest. And there's all kinds of things as they come into, into Jerusalem. And he comes in and he looks around. And it's already late, and so according to Mark's version, he goes out to Bethany with the 12. Now, he's going to go back and forth every single day. And on the next day, as he's going in from Bethany, he sees this fig tree, okay? So as he comes to this fig tree, he's hungry. I guess they didn't get breakfast yet. Well, he's hungry, and he goes over to see if he can find any figs. It would be just one of those things that you would do we used to pick berries along the path, you know, but that's been years ago. There's no berries in Arizona along the path. <laughs> but that would be some of the things you could do is just pick berries as you went along because they just grew everywhere. And so here's a fig tree. He goes over. It looks like a good-looking fig tree, and there's not a single fig on it. But it also gives you a clue here. It's not the season for figs. And so why would you expect anything to be on it? Just one of the things that you probably already know, because this is a familiar passage. Fig trees had two different times when they produced what we would call a fig. The first time, it's not a very tasty one. And it's just kind of a little bud, and it's kind of bland, and it's not all that exciting. And it would be there about this time. But he doesn't find any of those. And so I think it says it's not the season for figs, it's not October when normally the ripe figs would be there, when the really good figs would be there, but it is the season when something should be there. And so I think that's one of the things you have to understand, that's maybe the reason why he goes to look in the first place. But he sees this fig tree, and he's just, I don't know if it's just a bad day or what, but it, you know, this seems to be, does Jesus ever have bad days? I mean, if he's having a bad day, everybody around him's having a bad day, it seems like. And so this fig tree, as he's going in, is, there's no figs on it. Well, no one's ever going to eat fruit from you again. And sure enough, hmm, we're going to see what happens with all of that. So they go on into Jerusalem. In verse 15, it says, And they came to Jerusalem, he entered the temple, and he began to drive out those who sold and those who had bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. And he was teaching them and saying to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations, but you have made it a den of robbers? And the chief priests and the scribes heard it, and they were seeking a way to destroy him. For they feared him because of all the crowd, because all the crowd was astonished at his teaching. And when evening came, he went out of the city. So once again, you see him doing this. Okay, so the fig tree has already occurred as he's going in. Uh, he apparently doesn't have breakfast. He's mad at that. He gets to the temple and what does he find? But it's not looking like a house of prayer. It's looking like a garage sale. I mean, everybody's got all their stuff here. You've got people with the pigeons and the doves and, and the lambs and all these people who are changing money, trying to do that a little bit. You know, we'll give you a good rate. We'll switch your money for 30%. That's almost as bad as a credit card, isn't it? I mean, that's what he's saying, and he's looking at these people going, what in the world happened here? This does not look like a place of prayer. And so he gets rather excited and begins to throw things, including money, including cages, including doves or pigeons or whatever it is. And he says, you're not carrying anything through here. I'm not going to let this place be a place where you make money. You are not bringing anything through here. And so he stops them. Now, he's already done this once and threw them out with the whip. It doesn't mention a whip this time, but he's already stopped them from doing anything. So as you see Jesus doing all these things, it's, it's one of those, it's not really a pleasant day. I mean, this is a bad day, isn't it? 
first a fig tree and now he's basically cursing all the people in the temple? Sounds like he's got a problem, doesn't it? Because all the other rulers are watching and looking at this and going, huh, who does he think he is? And he says, this is not what was prophesied. Isaiah 56 and verse 7 talks about this as God's house being a house for all people. And Jeremiah 7, 11 saying his house has become a robber's den. It should have been a house of prayer, but it's become a robber's den. And of course, the Pharisees and the scribes had all were all okay with this. I mean, you can't just come in there and them not know about it and them but they're aware of it, and they see it, and they're doing all that, and Jesus is going through, and he's just tearing everything up. Well, you know, when somebody's really angry and really upset, you either have a whole bunch of guys with you, or you try to be careful about how to handle him. And apparently, there's not a good way to handle him or handle what he's doing, and he then sits down and begins to teach the crowd, and the crowd is astonished as he begins to explain to them what worship should be about. He's calling people to worship God. He's come there for worship, and it's not what he finds. He finds people who are there just to be able to make money. It's one of the best sermons that we don't have recorded. Don't you wish you could hear this one? I mean, if there ever, ever there were a fire and brimstone sermon, this would be it, wouldn't it? Because he's already thrown everybody out and he's already mad and he's probably already yelling. And if there was anybody to pound on, I mean, anything to pound on, he probably would be doing that and saying, you are not going to do this in my Lord's house. This is my father's house. This is a house of prayer. And you will not be acting this way in his house. And so he has forbidden them. He's turned over everything. He's a one-man riot. He's straightening out the temple worship. And when evening comes, he leaves and he goes. Well, he had already been there the day before, right? Yeah, triumphal entry comes in, at least for Mark's version. He comes in and he looks around and he goes, okay, we're going back. He knows what's there. And so he comes in the next day knowing what's there and purposely clears out the temple. And then he leaves to go back to Bethany. And so we have that recorded. And in the passage that was read for us out of Mark 11, as they passed by in the morning, he saw the fig tree withered away at its roots. And Peter remembered and he said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed has withered. And Jesus answered to them, have faith in God. What an incredible thing to say. Have faith in God. And so you can see as they're coming in the next morning, Peter is amazed at this. Look, the fig tree withered. Peter, you just saw Lazarus raised from the dead. You've seen blind men healed. You've seen lame men walk. You've seen diseases healed by the hundreds, if not the thousands. You have seen so many things, and you're impressed about a fig tree? Apparently. Look, it died. So that's why the other passage, you know, it was significant that he's able to say, you know, the fig tree died because we heard you say no one's ever going to eat fruit from you again, and of course it's not because look at that. Nobody's going to eat out of that tree. There's not a single leaf left. There's not a bud left. There's not anything left. And it looks so good. It looks so promising before. But Jesus' answer to everything is have faith in God. And that's an answer that he's trying to give to them. And he's about to try to say, here's what all of this, putting all of this together means. Let me go back to the passage. Because as you look at the passage, he's trying to say, Whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Now, be careful with the whoever, because a lot of times people want to say, well, whoever means whoever, and it can be anybody. I don't think so. I mean, that leaves Braden to be able to throw mountains everywhere. 
right, Braden? I mean, are we going to have any left? You know, it's just, it, it says whoever, and it doesn't put an age restriction on it, and it doesn't put a race on it, it doesn't put a, anything on it, and that's not what it means. He's saying whoever of my disciples, whoever is a child of God, whoever is a person of faith. And so I don't think he's just saying, you know, anybody in the world, whoever wants to move mountains can do so. And God will do it for it. No. He's saying whoever of my followers says this mountain needs to be moved, it'll move. So I think that's the first thing we have to understand. It's not just a, anybody says this. Now, does God answer prayers of everyone? Yes, he does. But is this whoever, everyone? I don't think is a anyone who says. I think this is people who are his followers, people who are his disciples, and that's where he's addressing the comment. Whoever does this but believes in what he says and has no doubt, it will happen what an incredible statement i mean just for us as christians because we are followers of god we are exactly who he's talking to here and so it's not just jews it's not just people who live then it's just not the 12 i think it's including all of us and maybe that's why the whoever isn't just for one single time period it's including us as well and so i think this is a promise that he's giving to us also whoever says is us so if you think about it what really happens is Jesus walks into a fig tree and he says there's no fruit here and he curses the fig tree and it, and it withers and Jesus walked into a temple and there's no fruit there and he begins to destroy everything that's in it he can't curse the temple but he sure curses the people who are there doing things He's expecting fruit. What he finds is a robber's den. And that is not acceptable. And we will wither trees and we will throw out doves and we will do whatever it takes because that is not acceptable. And Jesus says, it will change. The rest of us might be thinking, well, what can we do? I mean, there's not anything we can do. I mean, these are the scribes and the Pharisees. They're the guys in power. I mean, we just get arrested and thrown in jail. We might even be killed. And Jesus says, exactly. But it will happen. Their temple will be taken away. It will wither. It will be gone. He says, because you do not treat my God like this. And it's going to take another 40 years or so, and it will happen. It's amazing to watch how God works. It's amazing what he sees. Jesus expects fruit. When he sees the fig tree, there's not the slightest start of fruit, and so he curses the fig tree. I want you to think about what this means for us. Most of our issue is the how and the when. We talked about that last, last week. How would God ever do this? When would it ever happen? We pray about the when, the when, God, when. You know, sometimes it's just way too immediate. And that's where Peter sits. What if it all happened today like that? Whatever you prayed for, whoever you wanted to kill, I mean, no, no, no. Whoever you prayed that something would happen, I mean, they would be gone today. And every single thing that you said happened. Would that be good? Hopefully you didn't overstate anything when you were talking to God. Because if you did, we're hoping God has a little reasonableness and he understands what we meant. And I think scripture certainly indicates that. Are we expecting that? Is that something we think of when Jesus comes looking for fruit? Have faith in God. What does have faith in God mean? It means I'm coming looking for fruit, whatever it takes. Whatever it means to be able to move whatever's in the way. And if there's something in the way, then let's move it. Let's make it happen. Let's make something else happen. 
And it's just incredible to see those things at work. I saw this one. Do not ask God to guide your footsteps if you're not willing to move your feet. Not going to happen. And we wonder sometimes why it doesn't happen. Have faith in God. Nothing is living up to Jesus' expectations. He says, believe what you ask will come to pass and you will have it. Do you believe that today? Elders are going to pray in just a little bit. Do you believe that can happen? You can speak in faith and it will happen. He says, don't doubt in your heart. Be convinced that it is God's will. Be committed to be part of it. We get way too much of that. I think this ought to happen and, and you know, Terry ought to do it. Well, you know you're lost there. I mean, it ought to be somebody else who ought to do it. No, if you're going to pray about it and if you're going to say it and if you're going to claim it in faith, then it ought to be you that does it. Don't pray about something you're not willing to be involved in. And so I think that's the first condition that comes along with prayer. Believe in it. He says, believe you have received it. Not believe that it's already happened. I know sometimes we translate it that way as if, well, believe it's already happened. No, believe you've received the answer. And the answer might still be working out, and it still hasn't come yet. But whatever you ask in prayer, believe you have received it, that God's already said it's there. And maybe the when hasn't happened, but it's going to be there. Believe it like it's already coming. And when you stand praying, forgive. How hard is that? Ooh. That's kind of a mountain, isn't it? Anybody who has anything or anyone that you have anything against, if you expect forgiveness in your life, then you forgive them. Or God says, you already know what the condition is. If there's no, I'll forgive you just as much as you forgive. Well, that's a pretty big mountain, isn't it? So God, how is this ever going to happen? I don't like them. I don't think they're doing right. I don't think this is the way it ought to be. And can you pray for a mountain to be moved? And maybe it's moved in their life, but it also needs to be moved in yours because you've got a situation with them. And maybe your attitude about them needs to change. The point, I think, is this Jesus going to find faith when he comes looking into our life? Faith sees the invisible, believes the unbelievable, and receives the impossible. He goes to a tree when it is not the season for figs and curses it because it doesn't have any. Does that even make sense? And we can talk about early buds, late buds, all that kind of stuff, but I want you to realize what his point is with temple, what his point is with faith, is faith calls into being things that are not. And it does not matter whether this is the right season for fruit or not. It matters that you believe, that you call it into being, that you say, God, I believe this is possible. He is expecting out of your worship. Not money changers and excuses. Not people who don't quite understand what it's about. He's expecting faith. And he's expecting some movement in the mountains. Not the superstitions. But he has put enough mountains in your life for you to move. The question is, have you moved any of them? He didn't put them there for you to let them sit there, for you to fuss about and say, no, I don't like this. How about some faith to move them? And I think a lot of times those obstacles are put there intentionally just so that you can use your faith to say it can happen. God can move this. I mean, just think about the trip with Manos. I mean, Curtis thinks that, you know, I think some kids in El Salvador could be helped. Really? Curtis, you don't speak Spanish. No. So? He still doesn't speak Spanish. 
but there's been a lot of kids helped because somebody had an idea. And somebody brought it into being. We've got a village upstairs. How did it get there? It did not exist before. It's been there about three years. But somebody had an idea. And they called it into being. And they let things happen. And they make things happen because they pray to God. They believe God's going to act. They believe God is going to do something with it. And certainly it does. And we see this all the time. We see it and we expect it. And I hope if Jesus comes into this church, he's going to find some fruit. Whether it's time in our culture and society certainly doesn't look like it, does it? Not everyone's running to church. But we believe that God created and God still creates and God still moves mountains. The question is, as he looks at the end of this, he talks about the guy seeing sin. Can he move sin? That's a huge obstacle in our life. Will he find people who have faith, who look at the sin that's in their life and say, you will not be there anymore. And God, I declare, you will be gone. And the when and the how don't worry about the when and the how. Just have faith in God. That's what he says. And your life will be different next year. And we will change the world. And it will be a different place. See, baptism is a faith response to throw sin out of your life. That's what it takes. And then you do it every day from then on. Because there are obstacles and there are things that get put in your life. The question is, do you believe God or not? Do you have faith? Jesus' statement, when you run into fig trees or when you run into an absolutely corrupt temple, is have faith in God. It changes everything. The elders are going to pray. Maybe you need to come now and let them know what to pray about. Shall we stand and sing? Yeah.